helps if I unmute. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Um, I'm Addie Van Swell, and I will be introducing you um, to this really awesome webinar today. So we are going to hear from some of our colleagues um, at Share Our Strength with No Kid Hungry on the messages for communicating with eligible immigrant families about public benefit programs. So just a few reminders, um, if all attendees um, are in listen only mode, if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A icon that appears at the bottom of your screen. We are recording today uh, and it will be shared with attendees and available on the SBHA website. You are also able to turn on closed captioning by clicking on the CC button and please complete the evaluation and pull questions at the end of the presentation. So the School-Based Health Alliance works to improve the health and, of children and youth by advocating and advancing for school-based health care. Since 1995, the School-Based Health Alliance has supported and advocated for high-quality health care in schools for the nation's most vulnerable children. Working at the intersection of health care and education, the School-Based Health Alliance is a recognized leader in the field and a source of information on best practices for philanthropic uh, federal, state, and local partners and policymakers. Our focus uh, includes policy standards, data, and training to support and grow the school-based healthcare field, particularly in school-based health centers. We believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive, but too many struggle because they lack the equitable access to healthcare services. School-based healthcare is the solution, bringing health uh, care to where students typically spend the majority of their time in school. When health and education come together, great things can happen, attendance improves, conditions like asthma and diabetes are better managed, behavioral health issues get quick expert attention, and we all know that healthy students make better learners. So now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Sarah, to introduce her work at No Kid Hungry. Great, thank you, Addie. Um, hi, everyone, really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Sarah Mills. I'm a senior program manager at Share Our Strength. Uh, Share Our Strength is a nonprofit dedicated to ending hunger and poverty through grant making, advocacy, uh, and campaigns like the No Kid Hungry campaign. We know that hunger affects children in every community in the United States, um, but we also believe that it's a solvable problem and that effective programs exist to close the gap between kids who have enough to eat and those who don't. Um, however, sometimes these programs aren't reaching the kids who need them. So No Kid Hungry strategy focuses on problem solving and working with local partners to identify and eliminate the barriers for kids to access the healthy foods that they need. Uh, traditionally, the No Kid Hungry campaign has worked really extensively with schools to improve kids' access to food through school meals um, and other federal nutrition programs. Um, but for the last two years, we've also been partnering with the School-Based Health Alliance and with school-based health centers across the country um, to understand and implement strategies to connect kids with food in healthcare settings. And through our work together, we've learned a lot about promising interventions and they're all included um, in a toolkit available on the School-Based Health Alliance website. While we've um, been able to identify many successes um, in connecting kids uh, to food resources in, in school-based health center settings, um, there've also been some challenges and barriers um, that we've identified along the way. And this included you know, communicating about these programs to immigrant and mixed status families. Um, at the same time, that we were kind of having this emerging work with school-based health centers and learning um, alongside the School-Based Health Alliance. Share Our Strength was also involved in some research uh, and message testing um, around this very issue of communicating um, about federal nutrition programs um, with immigrant and mixed status families. So we're really happy to share what we've learned about addressing this challenge uh, in the webinar today. Uh, so our objectives um, for you all today uh, is to help to, you to understand the gap um, in enrollment for immigrant families in these programs um, and why, um, to recognize some of the research-informed messaging to support engaging immigrant families on federal benefits programs, 
um, and to know where to find tangible resources to support communicating um, this research with immigrant families. So I'm really delighted to introduce my colleague, Chioma Howenstein, um, the manager for underfunded communities at Share Our Strength. Chioma began her career serving as a teacher and then assistant principal in the New York City Department of Education. In her current role at Share Our Strength, she brings with her the lived experience of being the first American born in her family as her guide to develop partnerships and strategy to advocate for the health and well-being for immigrant families and other vulnerable communities. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Chioma. Hello, everyone. Um, we could go to the next slide. I am so extremely grateful and honored to be here with you all to share some important work and research that was done to support advocates like yourself um, and immigrant families across our country. Before I begin, I do want to say a few things. Um, that's why I have this little slide up here first. Um, on behalf of No Kid Hungry, the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition, and BSP Research, we absolutely value everything that you guys are doing and appreciate the great work that you all have done and continue to do for immigrant families in your communities. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, um, thank you, Sarah, again for that um, intro as well. Um, I was a school building leader uh, prior to Kiara strength, and I do remember the school-based health center that I had in um, my school and just what an integral support they were for families, um, especially those in need. So you all are in such a unique position to um, take this roadmap that I'm about to share to help these families. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize that what I'm about to share is not intended to subvert the efforts that you've done or to be a script, but really to be um, a roadmap to navigate these sometimes challenging conversations with immigrant families um, around benefits for food, housing, and health care. So today we're going to just share a bit of the rundown. Um, I'll go over some public charge background and the scope of the problem. Um, about this chilling effect that still persists, uh, do a bit of a research overview, um, share some of the words that work, that effective messaging brief, um, and then we'll have some resources um, in q &A. So public charge, um, just wanted to give some context to this. Uh, during the registration, some of you had mentioned um, just a bit of infamiliarity around public charge, which is super important to this topic. So I know public charge um, might sound a bit new to some of you. Um, it's been in the media a lot as of late, but it's not really a new um, term. It's been in part of immigration law for around a century. And really this term of public charge is um, for those who are currently in the United States, um, this policy really applies for those who are seeking green cards, right? And um, the Department of Health and Human Services, they have certain demographic factors um, that they really look at that aren't associated to public programs. Um, but also over the past 20 years, they're mainly focused on a person's use of certain safety net programs. Um, but in 2020, uh, the Trump administration had expanded um, what can be counted as a public charge to include uh, enrollment in Medicaid, SNAP, and Section 8 housing assistance, um, which is really important because these are three of the largest public programs across the country, each of which are serving millions of families. Importantly, this rule in 2021 was reversed by the Biden administration. Um, and they set in place that these programs and almost um, every other safety net program will now have no immigration consequences and have no impact on immigration applications. However, with the reversal of the Trump public charge rule, um, that has not fully thawed this chilling effect, right? Um, and essentially, because of the assertive efforts 
by the Trump administration and that policy change and also the attention that it really did garner in the media nationwide, the fear that gripped families, um, immigrant families, to pursue and enroll in these programs continues to persist to this day. And hearing from partners that utilization continues to be lower than pre-pandemic rates, um, which as we're all aware, just continues to deepen inequity in addressing needs for hunger and access to support that millions of these families are eligible for. So in order to thaw that chilling effect, we partnered, um, as I previously mentioned, the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition to engage BSP research to get a better understanding of how pervasive this issue was of public charge and that chilling effect um, across the United States. And we learned a ton of things, which I'll get into a bit um, afterwards, but really because of this research um, with BSP and Dr. Gabe Sanchez, who led this, um, we're now better prepared to support our national partners like yourselves um, to, to serve um, immigrant families and mixed status households. So we'll get into research highlights now. Um, so this words that work, right? We had a poll um, with this research conducted with BSP research team um, of over a thousand participants um, with the ranging from black, Latino to AAPI groups, um, mixed status, immigrant families, um, where we tested a number of different messages with these groups uh, to provide words that have been tested by them that for them were proven to be effective in increasing safety net program enrollment and resources that they need. So wanted to just highlight this, um, something that came out of the groups, um, the focus groups that were conducted with this poll was that immigrant families and um, others just do not recognize at times this term public charge. Um, so we found that really giving a basic definition for them um, can do, can make all the world a difference, right? So here it says the um, administration public charge regulation has a was a policy targeting lawfully present immigrants that put immigration applications at risk if they use public programs for healthcare, food, or housing. So once it was defined uh, this way, participants were just more engaged and just had a better understanding of the bigger picture issue around public charge um, and its impact. Uh, the main takeaway for this messaging is just to be sure to break this language down so that uh, families understand from the forefront um, about this issue when you're having these conversations. Right, and this is one messaging here. It says uh, food, shelter, healthcare. These are basic human rights every family should be able to count on. This was <clears throat> the most positively tested language across focus groups of the thousand participants. And really we're learning that also this was important to combat stigma. Uh, partners have told us that stigma tends to be a, a very deep running issue amongst immigrant families that they're still um, hearing and witnessing in conversation. So this messaging here around food, shelter, and healthcare um, being a basic right that every family should be able to count on tested most positively. This here um, is another uh, framing that I wanted to share as well. It's a bit longer. It says you work hard for your family, but every family needs help sometimes and helping families get through tough times is what government programs were designed to do. Especially right now, I highlighted this part in yellow because um, I really wanted to highlight this. Um, millions of families are using government programs for help with food, health care, or rent. So they can keep contributing to our community and our economy can grow over the long run. Um, so that millions of families part um, that are currently using government programs tested extremely well, emphasizing that 
these families aren't the only ones, right, using this program. It's not an isolated issue to them that millions of immigrants are using these programs every day and they're not seeing direct implications to their immigration statuses. So this tested very well, again, addressing that stigma issue that tends to run um, deeply into in immigrant spaces. So this was another um, message that, again, tested really well. All right, and now this part just breaks down into some of the nuances within immigrant communities. Um, we know that immigrant communities are not a monolith, right? They're not all one thinking the same. We have some that are a bit more uh, liberal leaning versus conservative. So label that as for blue states. Um, <clears throat> and this was really thought deeply by, by the researchers um, and BSP research team just how to frame these messages as they tested them across the focus groups. And at the end of the day, using names tend to work well with blue states or more liberally leaning or democratic states, right? So it's President Biden, again, with the names, um, and the Trump administration policy that put immigration applications at risk if lawfully present immigrants use public programs for healthcare, food or housing. Using these programs will have no effect on immigration status or application. Um, having the names was really um, important for more liberal or democratic leading um, immigrants in that were participating in this research, um, just because it emphasized the shift um, in policy, uh, being a part of the change in administration. Um, and now, oh, go back one more. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and again, while there are, you know, more democratic, uh, liberal leaning um, immigrants uh, in their politics, there are more conservative, immigrants, right? So really want to be careful around how things are being phrased in with families or in that are in geographies that are more red or purple leaning, right? You won't, don't want to emphasize that the Trump administration um, or emphasize that the Trump administration did this in, in any negative way, right? So it says the federal government has ended a policy that put immigration applications at risk if lawfully present immigrants use public programs for healthcare, food, or housing. Using these programs will have no effect on immigration status or applications. Um, and there's a difference, right, between the first one that named that the Biden administration and the, the Trump administration public policy versus this one, right, that has no names. And that was um, very important and tested um, more favorably, again, with families that were more conservative leading. Um, and please be mindful that in some of these places that are red or purple, um, they might be getting different or counter messaging. So just found that this message here hits home on getting the message across, but string from partisan dynamics. And at a high level, these were just some of them, just the messaging all in one that I previously shared. Um, and this is what you can use in the ground. Again, just want to emphasize that this is not a script. Please take this and make it your own. Um, this is just the wording of what was found by the BSP research team to land more favorably, uh, to help reduce stigma among um, families. And then the last two you know, are more specific for just where families are leaning in their politics, right? Um, Again, continue to emphasize that every family goes through hard times and millions of families are using these programs, thus um, hit the nail really well with families. Thank you, everyone.
All right. Thank you so much, Chioma, for that wonderful introduction to Words at Work. So at this time, we would like to invite you all to um, our questions and answers. So feel free to use the Q&A function um, in your Zoom control panel. Um, I would also like to introduce Ed Waltz. So Ed is a consultant to the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition. He's led communication efforts, and since 2018, the organization's outreach efforts have generated thousands of news articles, tens of millions of digital impressions, and 266,000 public comments, the most ever on a DHS regulatory proposal. So we're going to be kicking off our Q&A with some questions that we received from registration. Um, the first question we have is, can you elaborate on confidentiality and migrant status? All right, I'm unmuted now. Chioma, do you want me to take that one? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, hi, everybody. I'm Ed Walls with the PIF Coalition. Um, so it matters, so I'm going to say it. My wife is a trial lawyer, and she would encourage me to tell you that I can't give you legal advice and that if I mistakenly do, you should not take it. But um, but there are some protections in the law uh, for folks who... Um, are seeking uh, safety net programs, right? The big one, and you know, the, the challenge in a lot of this research is that um, a lot of folks affected by the public charge chilling effect live in mixed status families where, you know, the mom might be a lawful permanent resident, the dad might be undocumented, the kids may be US citizens, right? So complicated status issues there. And the most important privacy protection is generally the, person filling out the form doesn't have to give anything about themselves, right? They just have to, they don't have to tell the agency their immigration status. They don't have to show ID. That stuff matters only for the person who's getting the help, right? So in particular, if you're going to get a benefit for your kids and your kids are U.S. citizens, it's their documentation that matters, not a parent's, right? So like there are some protections out there in general, um, benefits granting agencies are not supposed to share personally identifiable information with immigration authorities. Um, but in, in addition, there is that sort of holistic protection that's provided by limitations on data requests for only the person who's getting the benefit. Does that make sense? I know we don't do feedback, uh, we can't get feedback on this, but um, please do chat out a follow-up if you have uh, a follow-up question. Feel free to use the Q&A if you have follow-up questions to Ed's comment. Um, the next question I have is, are there different benefit tiers for individuals who are going through the court process to obtain alien status? Yeah, so, um, so, let's start with different statuses, right? So there are different things for which folks who have different, like different immigration statuses are eligible, um, right? So in every state, every United States citizen is eligible for all the programs, right? Does it matter? You know, And this matters a lot for folks like school-based health centers who work with kids, right? Because um, the vast majority of kids in immigrant families are United States citizens. And so, it doesn't matter if, um, you know, I'm undocumented and my kids need health care or food, they should still qualify because they're U.S. citizens, right? And, and, and my immigration status has nothing to do with it, right? So um, lawfully present immigrants are often eligible for uh, like sort of the full suite of um, safety net programs, but there are some important exceptions. Um, there is a sort of, I'll just go ahead and editorialize, dumb uh, provision of the immigration. Uh, actually, it's a provision of Title 42, which is the Health and Human Services part of the law that says that um, a otherwise eligible, lawfully present immigrant is ineligible for Medicaid, SNAP, et cetera, for the first five years of their lawful status in the United States. That was just 
like I worked on Capitol Hill and the policy side of things for 15 years. That is dumb public policy, but it is the law. And so, uh, so for folks who have a green card or otherwise lawfully present and would be eligible, there is still that five-year bar that's in place for them. Um, and um, for folks who are undocumented, um, direct eligibility for federal programs is significantly limited, right? There are some programs like WIC where it doesn't matter, but the vast majority of, of federal programs do not extend relief to folks who are under, undocumented. Um, a couple of important exceptions there beyond WIC. One is emergency healthcare, right? Like if you get hit by a car, you go to the hospital, they take care of you, right? Another one is um, federally qualified health centers. They don't ask immigration status, right? So you can go in and, and get help for that. Um, the other thing to note, and I'm sorry, this is a long answer, but it's a surprisingly complicated question. Uh, the other thing to note is that times are changing, right? And so I don't know where folks are from, but in states like California, uh, Illinois, Connecticut, um, other states, um, there is an increasing state-sponsored safety net that provides like look-alike care and supports uh, for folks who are undocumented. So um, in addition to, you know, the original suite of federal programs. In some states, there are um, uh, there are additional programs that meet the same needs in different ways um, and that might be available to undocumented folks. Thank you. Um, next question I have is, can immigrant families apply for the Affordable Connectivity Program based mm -hmm. on their income? Yeah, um, good question. And the answer is yes. This is so for folks who aren't familiar with this program, this is a um, a federal communications commission program that is designed to promote um, internet access and make internet access more available to folks who wouldn't otherwise have it. Um, and yeah, there's no um, you know in general, folks in immigrant families can apply. Um, and there's more information available on the FCC website. Um, let's see if I can check this out. One second. This page on the FCC website provides some additional information. We'll make sure to share that resource out um, after this presentation as well. Great. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, another question we have is what kind of documentation is typically required for these families to access benefits? So um, immigrant families, mixed status families. Yeah. Well, so the documentation requirements are sort of broadly the same for everybody. Um, so in general, uh, agencies want to know who you are. So they want some documentation of identity. They want to know uh, about your eligibility, right? So there may be information required about income and assets in some states. Um, and another element of eligibility is, is immigration status. And so, uh, oh, sorry, my daughter Ava is homesick from school today. Ava, say hello. Hi. All right, go do something else. Yes, sorry. Go do something else. All right, bye, love you. Um, yeah, so another element of eligibility is immigration status. The most important thing to know about that is that if you have a kid like Ava, uh, who's born in the States, you know, she's a United States citizen and my immigration status says her dad does not matter at all, right? I mentioned it before and it bears repeating that like the documentation requirements only apply to the person who's getting the help, right? So at least with respect to citizenship status. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. And then last question from the registration is what insurance is best for undocumented pregnant women? Yeah. So a couple things to say there. Um, one is, um, there are, uh, in, in a lot of states, there is, um, 
a exception to the five-year bar and to other immigration, um, you know, status related barriers for women who are pregnant. Um, and, you know, the, so you should check with your state agency to see if Medicaid uh, might be available and if the children's health insurance program might be available. Those elections are made state by state. So it's not in every state, but it's a growing number. Um, so if, you know, if that's available, that's the way to go, right? Um, there are also, as I mentioned before, there are also like lookalike programs in, you know, California and other, you know, states um, that are increasingly popular um, and increasingly available. Um, so that's the second choice, I would say. Um, and then again, sorry to be a fanboy of California, but they're leading the way on this. There are also in some communities, um, local sort of last resort coverage programs out there for folks um, if they can't qualify for other initiatives. So, um, you know, if your state uh, allow, has the, it's called the IKEA exception, not spelled like the giant box store, it's a different acronym, but the IKEA exception uh, is, you know, your first choice, then, you know, a state standalone program. And then if, if, if nothing else, a, a local program. And then last thing I'd say is like, Insurance is a good place to start, but again, going to a community-based health center is, you know, next best, right? You know, whether you have coverage or not, you can at least get someone to have a look and make sure that there's nothing obvious problematic if you're pregnant. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, now we're going to move on to questions from our Q&A. So if you have additional questions related to Chioma's presentation or questions specific for Ed, uh, feel free to add those in the Q&A function. Um, looks like one of the questions Chioma has already answered, but I'm going to read it out if you have anything to chime in, Ed. Um, how do you respond to families that question about how receiving public benefits will affect them in the future if and when a conservative administration regains the White House? Uh, yeah, I saw your answer, Chioma, and I think it's spot on. I don't have anything to add. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, I guess I will add that that's one reason we pushed so hard for the Biden folks to take that extra step and formalize this policy change through regulation, because it does provide these additional, this additional level of protection against um, radical changes in the future. Thank you. Um, the next question is related. Why is it deemed necessary to identify the presidential administration responsible for making such decisions in public charge, especially when we are often dealing with families who have a language barrier? Why not just keeping it simple by saying prior restrictions have been lifted and now immigration status won't be affected? Yeah, good question, Allison. So uh, our research suggested that we should mention it because of the level of disinformation that targets immigrant families, right? So um, one of the, when we did, we did these focus groups after we did a, a survey of a thousand folks in immigrant families. And one of the big barriers was that, that we learned about in the poll was that folks didn't feel like the information they were getting was true, right? Like they were hearing that the policy had changed and they weren't certain that that was true. And, and candidly, understandingly, uh, understandably, given the amount of misinformation targeting immigrant families, that's totally reasonable, right? Like they wouldn't be sure that that information was accurate. One of the things that helped when we tested different approaches to talking about the policy change, one of the things that helped is if we named the principles, right? Like mm -hmm. essentially naming President Trump or the Trump administration and President Biden underscores the accuracy of the information for folks because it's just reasonable that, you know, political opponent reversed his predecessor's policy. That stands to reason for folks and it helped them to believe that the information we were giving them was true. Now, um, one of the reasons it's nuanced the way it is in the words that work document is because that actually largely was a function of one's partisan starting point, right? If, if I was a person who was sort of politically independent or moderate, or if I was progressive, that was likely to be reassuring to me. If I was um, someone who was politically conservative in an immigrant family, it kind of cut both ways, right? Like it did seem to still make folks feel like the 
change in policy made more sense, but it also triggered some of their own political mixed feelings about safety net programs. Um, and so we, um, you know, it, one of the things that's weird about opinion research and focus groups in particular is it's not like, you know, physics or chemistry where there's an obvious answer that pops out, right? It's it's like the ultimate qualitative research work. And so what we ended up doing there was sort of um, like splitting it halfway and like encouraging folks to use the approach that names the president in states where we knew that that in sort of in families and contexts when we knew that that made sense and in, encouraging folks to be more like little c conservative about it in uh in contexts where we thought it might cut both ways all right thank you for that um i don't see any other questions in the q and oh actually one more came in um, someone asked, am I correct that having a TIN or being in process of gaining a green card? Uh, being in process of, sorry, I lost the question. Being in process of gaining a green card um, can make you eligible for benefits like STAP. Um, can't know what happened to that one, but I heard it. Uh, and it's a good question. And um, I don't know about SNAP in particular, but I do know that um, being an ITIN can help folks um, with all kinds of things from applying for safety net programs to starting a bank account and making it easier to avoid um, uh, workplace wage theft, right? Like there's all kinds of benefits for families uh, to getting an ITIN. And, and my colleague, Alicia, who runs our community engagement working group has put together this great resource that I just chatted out um, on ITINs and, um, and the many benefits. For folks who are interested in going the extra mile, that page also includes a little promotional toolkit that you could use to help get those materials into hands of the families that you serve. All right, thank you. So we'll give you all a moment to see if there's any more questions. All right, so I think we can move on. Um, if you have any questions that come up after today's presentation, we will be providing um, both Ed and Chioma's contact at the end of these slides, um, as well as information to contact our SVHA team. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. And thanks for putting up with the uh, personnel changes on my end. Thanks, Ed. Um... I just wanted to highlight some of the resources uh, that was mentioned that you'll also receive in an email later on, um, the What's at Work brief that really just highlights and breaks down the messages that tested well with amongst participants, um, as well as just the isolated effective messaging without um, just more explanation behind it. We have those also translated into the languages that you see listed below. And that you know will be sent out to you as well. And last, how to reach us. Um, so thanks again, Ed, um, on behalf of PIF, one of our most trusted partners in this work. Thank you so much for being on uh, the webinar with us um, and BSP, both um, amazing organizations doing so much in the front um, and behind scenes. <laughs> for immigrant families just to create sustainable change and equitable change um, across the country. So thank you so much for uh, being a part of this. And I also wanna say thanks to Sarah Mills um, at Shira Smith Milky Hungry for liaising this conversation and especially School-Based Health Alliance and all of you advocates on the call um, for this opportunity to share this important work and this research. So grateful to be a part um, and grateful for, for the work that you guys um, are doing. And thank you so much. All right. So for Ed and Chioma, is there anything that you would like our participants to walk away from or anything important that we may have missed throughout today's webinar? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, two closing thoughts from me. One, uh, this research would not have been possible without the support of our partners at Nook and Hungry. So many thanks to you, Chioma, and to your colleagues. Um, and two, a big takeaway is um, it is safer than ever. Like there are more opportunities today than ever before for immigrant families to um, get the healthcare and help that they need. And so, um, we really appreciate the work of any partners in the Alliance who can help us to thaw that chilling effect and improve immigrant families' uptake of um, the programs that help folks get the support and care every family should have. All right, well, thank you both again for a wonderful presentation. Um, today's slides, resources, and recording will be available to all registrants in a follow-up email, and then the recording will be available on the SVHA website. Any additional questions, feel free to contact us. Thank you again to No Kid Hungry, Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition, and all of you for joining us today. Thanks, y'all.